Intramuros was the biggest European city in Asia. It defines our culture. The problem is most of our officials do not appreciate it. part of our history, part of our heritage, and one of the few physical evidences uh, remaining of uh, the uh, Spanish period of Philippine history. There are many good stories about Filipinos, people who headed the construction of the walls. The carvers were Filipinos also. It was a very exciting time. That's what I remember most, having a restoration force as big as Intramuros was at the time, well, didn't exist anywhere in the country. When we came into Intramuros to work, uh, what are we restoring? We do not know how did it look, except for the ruined walls. That's why we have to, to dig pictures and pictures and pictures just to be able to to provide a background. And in the early days, it was really a dead town. Even when Casa Manila was finished, we would make whatever pakulo just to bring in people. Uh, the greatest satisfaction I had was uh, the presence of a good team uh, because uh, basically the three of us uh, were the ones who set the initial uh, directions of uh, the Intramuros administration. Since last year, I'm really amazed at how Intramuros has grown and has attracted so many people considering the problems we had in the beginning. There are thousands of people coming here and all of them are paying the entrance fees, restaurants, everything, all those talents. Can you imagine? It's alive. You have many people saying that Intramuros should not be preserved because it is a colonial memory and that should be erased. I don't think so. So it's about time that our people should see Intramuros is not just a symbol of colonialization, but a symbol of our spirit to rise above that. If there's something about Manila that hasn't changed ever since, it's the lovely sunrise and sunset. As if reminding us that in all the chaos, there's still beauty to find in this place we all call home. And moving around it every day, doing the things that we have to do, we completely forget the invaluable history that it holds and the endless possibilities it can achieve. As Intramuros administration celebrates its 40th year, we also celebrate its people as we work together, inspire each other, and teach one another of the many ways why this city is a place we will always love to call home. Standing as one so that we never forget the past that taught us how to survive so we can move forward with a strong heart to build a future that we can all be proud of. We are Intramuros.
Intramuros was the biggest European city in Asia. It defines our culture. The problem is most of our officials do not appreciate it. It's important because it's part of our history, part of our heritage, and one of the few physical evidences remaining of the Spanish period of Philippine history. There are many good stories about Filipinos, people who headed the construction of the walls. The carvers were Filipinos also. It was a very exciting time. That's what I remember most, having a restoration force as big as Intramuros was at the time, well, didn't exist anywhere in the country. When we came into Intramuros to work, uh, what are we restoring? We do not know. How did it look, except for the ruined walls? That's why we have to, to dig pictures and pictures and pictures just to be able to, to provide a background. And in the early days, it was really a dead town. Even when Casa Manila was finished, we would make whatever pakulo just to bring in people. Uh, the greatest satisfaction I had was uh, the presence of a good team uh, because uh, basically the three of us uh, were the ones who set the initial uh, directions of uh, the Intramuros administration. Since last year, I'm really amazed at how Intramuros has grown and has attracted so many people considering the problems we had in the beginning. There are thousands of people coming here and all of them are paying. The entrance fees, restaurants, everything, all those talent. Can you imagine? It's alive. You have many people saying that Intramuros should not be preserved because it is a colonial memory and that should be erased. I don't think so. So it's about time that our people should see Intramuros is not just a symbol of colonialization, but a symbol of our spirit to rise above that.
please let us know so we can give the slot to another registrant. Now, I would like to call the administrator of Intramuros, who will introduce for us today a very special person who will give some warm words of welcome. Administrator. Good day, everyone. Um, it's our pleasure to welcome you all today. Intramuros was the center of politics, religion, trade, and governance for centuries. As part of the Intramuros administration's efforts to continue to advocate learning on the value of Intramuros, we are holding this series of uh, learning sessions as well today. So before we start, allow me to introduce our Secretary of Tourism and Chairperson of the Intramuros Administration Board of Administrators, Secretary Bernadette Romero-Puya for her opening remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, the webinar title is The Intramuros and the Making of the Filipino Nation. For more than 300 years, Intramuros was the political, administrative, religious, and trade capital of the country. It shaped local and global history. A lot has been written about the glorious past of Intramuros, but we have yet to learn its full scale. As Secretary of Tourism and the Chairperson of the Intramuros Administration, the goal has not been just to ensure people to visit the site, but more importantly, it is for people to learn more about the Filipino and who we are as a nation. The mandate of the Intramuros Administration is to ensure the orderly restoration and development of the district but aside from that, it must also serve as the principal advocate of its history. At a time when people are searching for knowledge, open to discussions and deliberation, we must tell the story of Intramuros now. We must tell the story of the Filipino. I wish you all a pleasant learning session under the able discussion of Professor Fernando Jalcita. Maraming salamat po, sir for agreeing to this. Admin Guillier, congratulations again for organizing this webinar. And to all the staff, hardworking staff of the Intramuros administration. Thank you and mabuhay po kayong lahat. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary, for those warm words of welcome. The title of today's episode is Intramuros and the Making of the Philippines uh, by our esteemed guest, Dr. Fernando Chalcita. Dr. Fernando Chalcita has an MA in Philosophy from the Ateneo de Manila and an MA and PhD in Anthropology from the University of Hawaii. He is presently a professor emeritus at the, univers at the Ateneo de Manila University and head the university's cultural heritage program. Though from Manila, much of his field research took place among the farming communities in Ilocos, Northern Luzon, and lately, however, he has shifted his focus to street research because of his interest in urban heritage and regeneration. Some of his books are Philippine Ancestral Houses, Authentic Though Not Exotic, Essays on Filipino Identity, and Capo Heart of Manila. Now, without further ado, may I now call on Dr. Shalcita. Dr. Dr. Z. Thank you, Francho Arcita, for introducing me. And I also want to thank um, Mr. Guillermo Acido of the Intramuros Administration for organizing this event. And I'd like to share that I fully agree with um, Secretary Bernadette Romulo Puyat in the task of not only conserving Intramuros, but also making it a place for people where they can learn about their, the, the past of, of the Philippines and the making of the Philippines. Thank you very much. Oops, let me just back to front, sorry. Hold on. Just backtracking to the start. Okay. 
Oh, then there's a problem with the age sequence. Because it's it uh, it starts with a definite panel. Just talk about something. Um. Okay. Basically, let, let me just um, explain why this. Well, this is being attended to. Let me just explain why this topic is of such great interest to me. When I was growing up in Manila in the 1950s, 60s. I could still see the ruins of many structures in Intramuros. And I thought these structures like Recoletos would endure forever. But they were uh, slowly taken down one by one. Meanwhile, my parents loved to talk about um, their beautiful memories of Intramuros. Both my mother and my father and my aunts and uncles loved to reminisce about Intramuros before 1945. So I felt cheated as I was growing up because I never got to see it. Now, um, of course, eventually, um, intramuros or parts of it were restored. But I always realized that uh, this restoration was always endangered because there's an influential segment in the Philippines that believes that intramuros has nothing to do with the Philippines because it is a symbol of colonial power. So why not just destroy it, or remove it? So uh, all through my life, I've tried to explain to others and to myself why we need intramuros. And this really is the, the topic of my lecture today. So um, first of all, as a clarification, let us talk of intramuros as Manila, down to the 1890s. It was not a district, but was all of Manila. I think the big problem sometimes when we talk about intramuros, we think of it as a district, but actually, it was all of Manila. In other words, it was the capital. Okay. The other thing to realize is this. Um, we, we tend to think of Bonifacio as crazy, foolish, for wanting to assault the walled city in August 29, 1896. Because we think it was a holy Spanish enclave. But in fact, by the time, it was not. And I think we re when we realized this, we realized Bonifacio was not really foolish. Because after the British invasion um, in the 18th century, many wealthy Manileños, especially the Spaniards, decided to migrate across the river to San Miguel, where they could have villas along the river with gardens and with um, bathhouses and with fresh air. Um, in fact, by 1842, there was a, there was a report to, uh, to the government that, in fact, half of the population in, inter, in the walled city was either Chinese mestizo, meaning Chinese father, Filipino mother, or native mother, or native Filipino. 100 lots, the, um, the different colleges, seminaries were full of Filipinos, and there were pockets here and there of slums. So the big problem is always how to keep the, the Spaniards, especially the Spaniards, wealthy Spaniards within Intramuros. And actually the exodus increased when uh, the Spanish uh, governor general decided to transfer permanently to Malacanang after the 1880 earthquake. So in fact, Bonifacio was not crazy in thinking he could assault the walled city because he could count on plenty of supporters within the city Plus, there had been an, a previous mutiny by the Tayabas Regiment in the 1840s. And Bonifacio was counting also on cutting off the electricity to all of Manila by attacking the electric plant in Quiapo. So he wasn't crazy at all. But this is just to show that, in fact, Intramuros was no longer a Spanish enclave. 
Um, we also have to be careful about judging the pre-20th century period wholly in terms of our own period today. Cultural relativism matters when we read history or in dealing with other cultures different from ours. Um, I'm an anthropologist where relativism is so important because we have to deal with cultures different from us across time and space, and always the importance is, is tolerance. Just to give an example, um, very often today we keep asking, oh, 19th century, how come public education was so late? Or if there was, how come um, it wasn't so effective? Or how come there was no public education 300 years ago before the 19th century? Uh, that is because public education is in fact so new a concept. It was really just invented in the 1850s. So when we, when we look, about, uh, look for public schools before the 1850s, we will be mistaken. You will not find them in any country in the world. We will not find them in the Philippines either. <coughs> schools here were either run by the religious or run by private tutors. <coughs> so this is something to consider when we judge intramuros. Okay, now, as a prelude, let's take a look at what was there before um, Manila under the Spaniards was founded. Let's take a look at the river chiefdoms. By the 10th century AD, there was a, an, a tondo. In fact, this is mentioned in the famous Pila copper plate inscription, which mentions a tondun, tundun. Most likely, this is what anthropologists would call a complex chiefdom. In other words, the ru ruler was a paramount chief who exerted influence ab above all other locals, local chiefs, but he had no power over them. It was just, just influence. And his influence reached settlements around the lake, such as Pila in what is now Laguna. Now, Tondo monop um, became wealthy because it monopolized the distribution of goods brought in by foreign vessels, especially the Chinese. Um, what the ruler of Tondo would do is that he would um, go to the Chinese vessels, remove the rudder, uh, and then take, um, buy in all the goods, take all the goods. Uh, and he would take care of um, distributing them all over the, all over the islands. Okay. And um, we know Tondo was a very creative place because we had this um, beautiful little gold money called uh, Piloncito. And uh, Tondo apparently developed Husi, well in advance of the Spanish period, Husi, um, very thin and transparent. And we know that uh, ancient Filipinos excelled in carpentry, especially for ships. Most likely the religion of Tondo was not Islam, it was animist. In other words, worship of the spirits of nature, worship of the ancestors mixed in with Hindu elements because Hinduism was spreading all over the country, though mixed in with local religion. Now, on the south side of Tondo, when the Spaniards came, was Manila. But how did it start? Um, if you go to Brunei, they will bring you to the mausoleum of Sultan Balkia the Great, who supposedly conquered Manila in the early 1500s. I don't, I don't think uh, he attacked Manila. I think what he attacked was Tundon, because there was no Manila yet. In fact, because of that attack, he was able to found Manila as a fortified trading outpost on the opposite side of the passage. And um, the rulers that were installed were kinsmen to the royal families of Brunei and Sulu. Therefore, uh, he had influence over Manila, through his kinsmen. Now, uh, when Manila was formed, they were the ones who now took care of retailing the goods seized in Tondo. Um, they, they took care of retailing these foreign goods all over the islands. Now, elsewhere in the Visayas, elsewhere in Luzon, in the Visayas, definitely the most important port in the, in the Visayas was Cebu, which apparently was also ruled as a chiefdom rather than what we would call a state because Humabun had influence over other chiefs, but he could not necessarily control them like Lapu-Lapu. Outside Manila Bay in Cebu, however, what we would have found would be, would be hundreds of small independent villages governed by their leaders. 
In other words, the settlements were dispersed and small in population, probably 10, 10 houses, 50 house, houses. Now, the reason for this was because the basic livelihood, believe it or not, was actually kaingin, or what you could call in English, Sweden shifting cultivation. Why kaingin? Why not wet rice? Because the geography of the Philippines actually consists of hills and mountains with thick forests, especially then. Um, the wide, flat river plains that you find in the rest of um, parts of Southeast Asia, like Java or Cambodia or Thailand, did not exist here. So it was really more practical for people, given the fact that there was no plow, to just um, resort to kaingin, open a patch in the forest, uh, cut down the trees, burn that patch of the forest, plant for three years, and then move to another part of the forest after three years to let the forest regenerate. But that meant dispersed populations. Okay. So very hard, very hard to um, create um, large uh, kingdoms on the basis of shifting cultivation. And we know from records that the prevailing religion was, again, um, the worship of spirits of nature, and the spirits of the ancestors. And all over the Philippines, we know for a fact, based on excavations, that gold work was beautifully done. And um, we know too that textiles reached an important zenith in parts of the Philippines. And carpentry, the Filipinos have always been good in building ships. In fact, they could, they, they could create um, ships whereby one, one ship, one small ship was inside another ship, inside another ship. Okay, now, return to Mindanao. Um, in Mindanao, the situation is different. Here you have, uh, by the 10th century, you find a chiefdom that controlled the uh, Agusan River Basin, and it has left as a legacy. It was rich in gold, and one of the... Um, most interesting um, statuettes in the Philippines is really the, the, ta, the um, statuette in, in Agusan representing the goddess Tara, the goddess of prosperity. And other spectacular gold artifacts have been found, which can be appreciated in the Ayala Museum. We know too that it was his close ally of the Hindu kingdom of Champa in Indochina. This comes out in the Chinese records. Now, by the 1400s, there was a state at last that appeared, the Sultanate of Sulu, whose influence extended from Sula, Palawan down to Moluccas and part of Borneo. Okay, so that was the situation. If you, if you look over the overall situation, therefore, you find on the one hand dispersed settlements in most parts of the archipelago, but emerging centers of power and influence. The most powerful was Sulu, and given time, it would probably have exerted um, a strong power over Manila, would not develop a strong alliance with Manila. Now, let's take a look at Manila's contributions to the making of the Filipino nation. Let me just summarize five things. First of all, it was Manila that unified most of the archipelago. It promoted a more humane morality. It connected us to the modern global economy. It fostered the humanities, sciences, and arts. It created a culture that is globally connected, yet regional. Um, okay, Why, uh, unification under one state. Okay, the Spaniards, together with their local allies, organized the entire archipelago as part of the Spanish state, a subset of the Spanish state. It was organized a captaincy general under the Viceroy of New Spain. In other words, Capitania General under the Viceroy of New Spain. New Spain was the term for Mexico, um, part, of the, part of the American Southwest, all the way down to Central America. But the Viceroyalty of New Spain was itself under Spain, under Madrid. Now, this, uh, finally, there was a regular system of taxation to finance a day-to-day -day formal government because you cannot have a state 
if you don't have a regular system of taxation because how would you play uh, how would you pay your bureaucrats there was no one administrative system that came about the lowest level as we know is the barrio which we now call barangay again um, the different barrios formed a municipality under a mayor then the municipalities formed a province to span the entire archipelago in fact we have retained this until now there was also a unified judicial system reaching from top to bottom in fact um there was one written legal code that was enacted throughout originally it was the leyes de indias eventually it was the spanish civil code which was introduced in 1889 based on the civil um, code tradition of Europe. Um, this, is, this continues to be the basis of our legal system today. So the first phase of unification was to consolidate the Philippines as a state, albeit as a subset of the Spanish state. Now, the second stage in unification was done by Filipinos themselves. Um, following the French Revolution of 1789, liberals began to conceive of the state as deriving its legitimacy no longer from the king. In other words, the state was legitimate not because the dynasty was superb, okay, not, not because this dynasty was glorious, but because um, the state was the work of the people themselves, the, the nation. Um, nation in Spanish, which Filipinos would translate into Bansa or Bonifacio into Haring Bayan. In other words, the legitimacy of the state derived from the people themselves. Now, this new vision, which was democratic, was conceived by Rizal, Jacinto, Mabini. They had studied Manila schools. Um, now, it's true the ideas of the French Revolution would, were not allowed as reading in, in schools. But nonetheless, it, it was impossible that they would not know about this because they had to know, the students had to know the history of Spain and Europe. So they would learn, learn about this. Plus, the relatively free press in Manila simply discuss, took, took these ideas for granted and discussed them. Plus, there were smuggled books. And then, all, now, Bonifacio himself didn't go to these schools, but he was a man who was widely read. He read on his own. So we can say that uh, in, a, uh, in a very strong sense, 1896, the revolution actually began to ferment in Manila within the walls. Fittingly, um, the Philippine Assembly took its seat at the Ayuntamiento in 1907. Now, what is the Ayuntamiento? That was actually uh, the building um, on the uh, Plaza Roma today, which has served as the seat of government in different ways. Originally, it was the Casas Consistoriales. Here, the laws were made for the archipelago. At the same time, this was where the governor general um, presided over councils. And this is where the system of courts was lodged. Now, um, when the Americans took over and recognized the right of the Filipinos to demand uh, their own government. The first Philippine assembly took place here. Okay. Uh, it's, it's wonderfully restored. Let me just point out, it was not just the first Philippine assembly that took place here. The, um, our system of uh, courts with the Supreme Court at the start originally took, um, was also housed here. The next thing to realize is that Intramuros prom promoted a more humane morality, Christianity. Islam, of course, is humane, but let, let us just focus on Christianity. Now, indigenous religion had many merits. However, it's centered exclusively in the king group. Um, Simbahan in those days meant really the dwelling of the chief. That is where the rituals invoking the ancestors were held. Nankin, outsiders to the barangay, were excluded. Um, members of other barangays could be either friends, they could also be enemies. There could be animosity between barangays. Now, um, you'll be surprised about how 
entry to the next world was calculated by our ancestors. They base it on social status in this world. Now, as Christians, we base it on merit, right? If you're, if you're a good man, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell. You get punished. But our ancestors base it on social status. Um, were you wealthy? Were you brave in war? Did you die single or did you die married? That would determine your status in the next life. That is why our ancestors are buried with their material possessions. And it was a disgrace for anybody, especially a woman, to die unmarried. Now, um, to, to, to assure that the, um, the, 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 the dead beloved would be comfortable in the next life, strangers were sacrificed to accompany the beloved to the next world. That is really the origin of the headhunting raids, which were so common in indigenous Southeast Asia before. Upon the death of a relative, um, strangers could be killed to accompany the relative into the next life. Now, what did the uh, missionaries do? They created Simbahan by giving it a new dimension. Simbahan was public space, namely the churches, open to all kin group, even those in conflict. Um, the task of, of the missionaries is always to bring these dispersed settlements under the under the sound of the bells, because it's, it was very difficult to preach if you're going to if you're going to go from one dispersed nayon or settlement to the next. It is better to consolidate, and they 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 preach the notion that notions in the next life actually depended more on your merit. So there's actually upward mobility. If you died poor or sickly, you could still be exalted as a saint. And they pointed out the, the importance of the individual. You cannot sacrifice the individual for the convenience of the Lord because as Christians, people believe that Christ redeemed each and every one of us through his sacrifice. Now, it was not easy for the missionaries, however, to do this because they risked their lives going to forests and mountains. Um, they could not always be assured of an armed guard um, if there was an armed guard, um, the armed guard would be only a few people. So they had to de depend on their powers of persuasion. They had to learn the local language. They had to, to live with the people and to help them in many ways, to show them that um, they, they intended only to promote their, their, their good. Um, just to show you, one of the things the missionaries did, which would surprise many of us, is that they diffused the plow because one reason why it was so difficult to farm, especially in the uplands, was um, people were using only spades. They were not using the plow. So it was the missionaries who diffused the, the plow in its Chinese form uh, among Filipinos. They, they, together with the Chinese, they taught Filipinos how to hitch the plow to the carabao. And you know, the Chinese plow was actually very efficient uh, because it can, it's more efficient than the Western type because it can, um, its iron tip can dig deeper into the ground and it lets the soil fly past, okay. Uh, also, it requ requires only one single carabao. In, in Western type, you need two oxen. Now, mi missionaries also made sure that the parishioners would have some material benefits immediately. So they taught them, new crops that could help stave off the hunger. Because um, the thing with rice is it grows only part of the year. So what do you eat the rest of the year? So the missionaries introduced camote from Mexico and corn to add to the root crops that Filipinos already practiced. Now around the parishes sprang up many of our towns and cities. So when you think about um, our towns and cities, usually the the foundation days, the foundation of the parish centuries ago. At the same time, the missionaries realized that they attend to the uh, med, uh, health problems of uh, their parishioners. Hospital de San Juan de Dios is actually the oldest hospital in Southeast Asia. It opened in 1578 to minister precisely to the poor and the sick. This is within the wall, so you cannot say that the only, um, only Spaniards were within the wall because Nat um, the native poor and the native sick entered the uh, Hospital de San Juan de Dios. An offshoot of this 
was the Hospital de San Lazaro, which took care of lepers, um, which is pro probably the first leprosarium in Southeast Asia too. Intramuros also, con Intramuros or Manila more properly, connected us with a globalizing modern economy. Before 1571, Tagalogs engaged actively in the regional trade with Manila and Tondo as the core. After 1571, the Galleon trade connected together the four continents, Europe, Asia, Africa, the Americas, for the first time in history. Manila was the world's first global city, per David Arding, a British historian who has worked on music in Manila. And on, on the corner above, I'm showing you the list of peoples that Father Morillo Velarde listed as, um, as available in Manila. He said, if you stand at the, at the bridge connecting Manila to Binondo, which is now Jones Bridge, you would have witnessed all the different nations of the world passing by in an afternoon. Um, peoples from all over Asia, from all over Europe, uh, from India, pe peoples from parts of Africa, peoples from the Americas. And this is why, according to another, another priest, it was so hard to hear confession in Manila. Note, however, this, despite the heavy export of goods from all over Asia, uh, Philippine goods actually were exported for the first time from the Philippines, specifically from Manila. I mentioned, um, for instance, Ilocano cloth, cotton cloth, which was in high demand in Mexico, the New World. Cotton was also cotton, cotton cloth was also produced in the New World, but the demand for Ilocano cloth was was because it was very sturdy. According to my wife, a textile specialist, um, the threads were double plied and um, they were really um, beaten together tightly. Okay, so this is the Galleon trade. Um, it didn't just connect us with, um, Mex with Mexico, as many people think. It connected us on the one hand with all of Asia and through Mexico it connected us with Spain. Now, the reason why, that, uh, why people came to Manila was because um, Mexico City, through its royal mint, produced silver coins of excellent quality. So this became the unit of currency throughout Asia, especially in the Chinese empire. The Chinese empire was the biggest importer of the silver coins. So down to the 19th century, this was the unit of currency throughout Asia. By the way, um, another word for peso in Spanish is dollar. Another way uh, it connected us to the globalizing modern economy was through um, connection to capitalism. In the 1800s, merc mercantilism, which was dominant in economic thinking all over the world, finally collapsed. Instead, um, free trade became the mode. So Manila and other Philippine ports were open to international trade. Okay, now, um, Capitalist economy demanded uh, free circulation of money. So the first government bank in Southeast Asia was the Banco Español Filipino de Isabela Segunda. It is now the BPI. It was first lodged in what is now the ad aduana, and then eventually moved across the river to Binondo. In the meantime, from Manila, capitalism entered the countryside, generating exports of cash crops like sugar. Uh, this created a very wealthy um, middle class in the Philippines. Uh, the middle class was composed um, Chinese mestizos, native Filipinos, and some Spaniards. Okay. Entrepreneurs opened also varied enterprises in Manila and other cities. So, um, for example, the Padillas became renowned for their shipping lines. Manila also fostered the humanities, sciences, and the arts. You have to remember that worldwide before 1850s, free public education sponsored by the state did not exist. Okay, that's one, thing, one, one consideration. When we keep wondering what, what about public education, it hardly existed elsewhere, it did not exist. 
um, university education in the West was only for a small elite. However, after 1850s, um, something happened. The, the Spanish government mandated that both in, in Spain itself and the Philippines, there should be free public schools to give primary education to both towns, to both boys and girls. So um, if you go to Philippine towns, there's still some of these old structures in the 19th century left made of stone and brick. And of course the seat, the controlling uh, center for this um, public, public instruction was Manila. Meanwhile, um, UST in 1611 opened its doors to native Filipinos, naturales, and Chinese mestizos. In the 1760s, UST was the only university in Southeast Asia, and pretty much for the rest of the 19th century, it was the only functioning university in Southeast Asia. And mind you, it was accepting not only Europeans, but um, in fact, people born in the Philippines of native mothers and Chinese, Chinese fathers too. Intramuros also fostered humanities, sciences, and arts. Okay. Definitely uh, geometry and trigon trigonometry were, were taught by the early 1700s because otherwise Pedro Murillo Velarde could not have made that map. Um, by the middle of the 19th century, 19th century, statistics had become important because this is important for running a government. You have to have uh, regular statistics. Biology began with the missionaries um, examining um, carefully local flora and fauna so that they could come out with books, with guides that could guide their parishioners on what plants could be used. The most famous example is a book by Father, um, Father Blanco, Augustinian priest. Uh, chemistry was, was taught in Ateneo and UST, which had functioning um, chemistry laboratories. And of course, mechanics was taught to create better, uh, better machines. Uh, medicine opened in UST by 1871. At first, enrollment was small because uh, not all could, uh, people was want, were wondering how they would make a living out of medicine, but eventually the, the enrollment increased. Uh, astronomy uh, received a push when the Jesuits returned in the middle of the 19th century, because wherever the Jesuits go, they, they often open a lab, um, an, um, an observatory that has been part of their charisma. Now, I want to say something about the Observatory de Manila. It was important, not only for the Philippines, but for the rest of East Asia. Uh, this weather bureau actually was able to forecast the coming of typhoons, which are always a big problem, um, so, um, confronting East Asia, because they could just strike suddenly without warning. So the Jesuits were able to devise a warning system that would inform the rest of the region about the arrival of, of a typhoon. So in effect, the Observatory de Manila became the unofficial weather bureau, even for East Asia, for Tokyo, uh, Shanghai, Macau, Batavia, and Indonesia. They, they relied on weather reports coming from the Observatory de Manila. Human, the uh, social sciences also began because sociology began to be taught in the UST. Now, um, if, you can, if you compare um, the Philippines to the rest of the region, you'd be wondering why it is there was no stone architecture in the Philippines before the 1600s. Well, the, um, the reason for that is precisely because we were living in dispersed settlements. The Great Borobudur, one of the most sublime monuments constructed by mankind, began actually, uh, or rather was finished in Java, central Java, by the 10th century. By the 12th century, the great city of Angkor, with about 100 people, 100 million people, I'm sorry, with 1 million people, had already been constructed in Cambodia. And um, you visit Angkor today, you'll be amazed at the 
the quantity and diversity of its temples. Uh, why was nothing like that in the Philippines? Because, as I said, of dispersed settlements. Uh, but this came up. But this problem has ended once um, missionaries are able to gather people in, to nucleated settlements, and um, with the help of the Chinese, taught our ancestors stone masonry. A very good example of that, of course, is San Agustin. Although we were um, behind before. With San Agustin, we actually finally became frontline because um, San Agustin introduced the stone arc, which, which is able to span much larger distances than uh, conventional traditional architecture before. Um, painting painting uh, also um, was, in, was introduced via the, the schools set up by the missionaries. Um, yes, boats, I'm sure, are painted, houses are painted, but painting as we know it, to decorate surfaces, to the, interpret an event, really be, begins only during the Spanish period. But the, um, um, the way our ancestors took to it is amazing because uh, look at how Luna was able to master the craft. This is a painting by Luna called La Battaglia de Lepanto, the Battle of Lepanto which depicts how Don Juan de Austria was able to conquer the Ottoman Turks you know, by ramming their boats. The painting is so splendid that it now hangs in the Spanish Senate in Madrid. Um, it was also in Tramuros where Tagalog literature flowered. Caspar Aquino de Belen, with his Pasiang Mahal, Father Mariana Pilapil, sorry, um, Gaspar Aquino de Belen with his Passion, Father um, Mariano Pilapil with his Passion Henesis, which is still chanted today, and Balaktas, of course. The locus for a lot of this flowering took place in the Colegio de San Jose in Intramuros. Here is a line, a stanza from Father, I'm sorry, from uh, Balaktas. Uh, which is memorable for us Filipinos because it is the first reference to Bayan as not just a, a small locality, but all of the country. Salobad Labas ng Bayan Kunsawi. Okay, um, I just want to point out that uh, Intramuros or Manila actually fostered vocational schools as well, and all were public, therefore free. Here's a list the nautical school. Which is uh, which still runs today, albeit in a different way, different not, uh, name. The School of Commerce, the Academy of Painting and Drawing, the Practical School for Botany, the School for Telegraph Operators, School for Agriculture. Now, Intramuros also created a, a culture, which is our culture today, that is global yet regional. Here is Matteo Ghirecelli and Sara Geronimo. They represent different races, different ethnicities. Now, in the Philippines, interracial, interethnic marriages are taken for granted. But why? Why is it not taken for granted in the rest of the region? I have this um, friend from Central Europe who married a Thai lady. They have a child, but he prefers to live in Manila rather than Thailand because he says in, the, in Manila, um, Results of such unions like ours are taken as normal, not yet in Thailand, he said. Now, the reason for this is because there's a sharp contrast between British and Dutch colonies and Spanish colonies on the, um, on the other hand. In, this, in British and Dutch colonies, there was pressure to keep uh, Europeans separate from native people. Um, marriages were uh, across racial and ethnic lines were frowned upon. In fact, they were often illicit, not in Spanish colonies. Uh, as long as they were performed in church, it was okay. In fact, that was one of the cornerstones, cornerstones of the Spanish Empire. Um, mestizo in, in Spanish does not mean white, it simply means mixed. So the Chinese mestizos were a very important element in the Spanish. Uh, Spanish Philippines because they were they actually formed um, 
most of the elite, the Chinese Mestizo, so not really the Spanish elite or only a small number. In contrast, in the U.S., down to the 1950s, states forbade such marriages. In Manila, there was, of course, tension because uh, there was a racial ethnic pyramid. There was competition. In fact, that is really what brought about the revolution, right? I mean, the, the, um, the parishes, the positions in government were given to those coming from the peninsula. And that, of course, caused the resentment. But otherwise, there was actually a lot of mixing. Just taken for granted that people could sit together at the same table, they could intermarry, they could attend, attend the same schools, as long as they were Catholic. You can see family names in Manila and the rest of the country are diverse, indigenous, Chinese, Spanish, French, like Bonnevi, German, like Mulak, Italian, like Hidoti, Greek, like um, Amoranto, Arab, like Hamadi, Danish, like Rulf, Japanese, like Ishikawa. And names for family relations in Tagalog are indigenous, huh? Chinese, Spanish, even Owatl. Um, it is not appreciated that Tata and Nanay, which are such important terms in Tagalog, actually come from Mexican Indian language. Uh, a good example of mixing is our cuisine, Champurado. Very, it's a fi Filipino staple. Um, cacao tablea came from Mexico. What, what did their ancestors do? We mixed it with sticky rice and with milk and threw in something very Southeast Asian. We threw in um, salted fish. Very, very, diff very different, but very tasty. At the same time, the word champur is interesting because it's Malay. Champur simply means mixture. So um, this culture that is original yet uh, global can be seen very clearly in our houses. Um, you can no longer see houses as they stood in Ramuros because these houses were all wiped out. So I'm bringing you to Vigan to see the Kema house and part of the uh, Burgos house. What supports these structures is really the same principle as in native houses. The heavy woodwork is supported by um, wooden posts that go all the way down to the, to the, the ground. So that in case of an earthquake, the house does not crumble. It just weighs from side to side. It still happens today in these houses. At the same time, um, the upper structure was of wood, the lower structure of stone. Now, it's very interesting how these uh, oyster shell windows came about. Uh, as uh, Dr. Wenga pointed out yesterday, oyster shell windows originated in Goa. In the Philippines, we incorporated them do, but we make them slide. Could the influence be Japanese? Something to look into. Meanwhile, we invented another window, the ventanilla, to accommodate more air. So, in Tramboras de Manila, it's really the city that made a nation. Definitely, um, without Intramuros, we cannot understand the Philippines. We cannot understand the achievements of our ancestors. With that, I'd like to close. But before that, I'd like to acknowledge those who have helped me with this PowerPoint. My thanks to my wife for insights regarding Ilocano cloth. My son, Rahul, for help in digital procedures. Dr. Regalado Trota Jose of the USD Archives for relevant information. And um, Dr. Eliza, Eliza de Castro of the USD History Department for guidelines on the history of science in the 19th century. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you Dr. Shalita, for the presentation. It was a very uh, stimulating discussion. We are now opening the online floor to our audience who wishes to ask questions. So we are now going to our open forum. I would like to remind everyone that if you have questions, you may raise them via our Q&A button, which is found in the lower portion of the screen. And for those who are viewing our episode via FB Live, Questions may also be raised by the comment section. So let's see if there are questions. Okay. So the first question is, sir, uh, you talked about public education a while ago. Uh, you referred to 
UST as the only higher institution of learning in Southeast Asia, and you also refer to the public schools run by, run by the churches. Now, the question is, was it purely funded by the church? Uh, where did the funding go? Is it, was it funded by the church since all of these schools were owned by the church, or were these schools also subsidized by the government? Uh, okay. so, also, also um, did they charge tuition? Uh, and if they did charge tuition, was it subsidized? Okay, good question. You have to distinguish between the parish schools before the decree of 1863 and the public schools after 1863. You had parish schools before the decree of 1863. They were run by the um, priests in their parishes. From my understanding is they were free. Okay, they were funded by the Caja de Comunidad. Okay. Now, 1863 um, is different. Those were what we would really call public schools now because they were run by the state. Because before, eight, before the 1860s, it was not considered the responsibility of any state to run schools. But the change of thinking came about in the 19th century, uh, starting in Western Europe. The idea was, okay, no more, no more union of church and state, okay? So the church, the state must take over functions formerly uh, done by the church. Now, one function was education. So the idea was, okay, the state must provide free public education funded by the state. However, because of the union of church and state in the Philippines, um, the control of this public, public school system was really still controlled by the missionaries with UST as a seat. So that was actually a bone of contention uh, between liberals in Spain, in the Philippines, and the church, because the liberals wanted a, a completely secular public education. I see, sir. They were free, by the way. They were free. If you talk about public education, it's already free. Yeah. I see, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is within the context of F. Shunil's opinion on Intramuros. Uh, I think he's talking about uh, an article, a news article from F. Shunil Jose. So he's asking whether or not Intramuros should be preserved and under what context? Should be it under uh, a Spanish colonial context or something else? Well, as you can see from my discussion, you have to preserve it as a Filipino city. As a Filipino city, city that, co that co um, contributed to the making of the Philippines. It started as a colonial enclave, but eventually it assumed new meanings when, Filip when Filipinos began to assert themselves. Okay, sir. We have another question from RJ Punong Bayan. Sir, you said that Intramuros and Manila is a city precursor to making the Filipino nation. Today, most Generation Z people are now having, having a loose or weak belief on this image. What measures can we implement to reignite this, in your opinion? Well, that's a good question. I think we have to rewrite our history books. <laughs> Start rewriting our history books. Because we still have this notion that I ah, Intramuros and it's not only for the Castilla. It's not true. Uh, thanks, sir. Hola, Dr. Z. I miss your classes. How do we remove the colonial hang-up that disables people from appreciating the positives during the Spanish regime? Because of the biased introduction of, on Philippine history, we fail to know more so appreciate these cool facts. Well, it's very interesting to, to hear what Father Horacio de la Costa, Filipino Jesuit, once wrote. The reason why the Spanish period looks dark to us is because we are in the dark about it. We don't know enough about it, he says. So we really have to know more about it. And I think uh, we have to, to see it as a chiaroscuro. By chiaroscuro, I mean, what, what's that? Um, light and shadow. Because we always look upon it in terms of shadows. Light and shadow, see also what uh, 
positives con uh, were contributed. Our next question is from Jan Angelo Faustin Rosales. Good day, sir. As for the restoration and development of Intramuros, how will the Intramuros administration address some of the informal set settlers living within the vicinity? We so how, what is your suggestion for the Intramuros administration on, on this issue? Well, this is what I've always told uh, former Intramuros administrators. I think informal settlers have to be allowed to stay because they've already lived there for decades now. Uh, I think we will be creating another injustice by driving them out just to create a tourist enclave. Now, the problem though is how do you convince landowners to allow parts of the property to be transformed into social housing. That has really worked, but I think it would be it would create another injustice if you drive them out. Because I was I, actually uh, years back I did a study in Tramuros. I was talking with um, representatives from each of the five barangays in Tramuros, and I found that it's so difficult for them because okay, so they have been relocated to outside the city, to outside Metro Manila. But they still have to to come to work within Intramuros because that's where the livelihood is. So what some of them were doing was they would um, spend six days a week sleeping in a crowded area just so they could ply their trade by day. So this this issue has to be addressed. Otherwise, we'll be per 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 perpetrating the idea that Intramuros is about injustice. Thank you, sir. We have another question. I'd like to clarify where the window shelf paints originated. Ah, it's a good question. I used to think um, the idea was indigenous. I thought it was inspired by Chinese use of thick paper for their windows. As it turns out, according to Pedro Luengo, the idea originated actually in Goa. That's the oldest documentation. Uh, India. So, because of the um, strong relationship between Goa and, and, the, and Manila, the idea soon traveled to Manila by the 1600s. It was incorporated into our windows. Thank you, sir. Uh, this question is for me, from me. Uh, earlier in your slide, you showed a picture of the Golden Tara. Uh, is, the gold, is the discovery of the Golden Tara conclusive uh, evidence of an uh, Indianized art or culture here in the Philippines? Yes, I mean, there were pockets of Indianization in the Philippines, definitely. But two ones suggest that, and the, the gold jewelry that is on display at Ayala Museum shows that um, Indianization was alive and well in parts of the Philippines. Not necessarily all, but there were pockets. Another question, sir. You mentioned the pre-Hispanic period of Intramuros. Now, th now do you think uh, there has been enough research about the topic? And if, there, if not, what areas do you think needs improvement in terms of research? We need archaeology. <laughs> we need diggings within Intramuros. We also need diggings on the opposite side of Intramuros, in Binondo. But I'm afraid all of that has been uh, destroyed already by all the high rises. We need we need more archaeology to find out how Manila began. Thank you, sir. Um, we have another question. Did the public school system in the early years, uh, I think he's talking about the 19th century, was it inclusive or what? Uh, what were the requirements for admission? I think he wants to enroll. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, if you're a member of a, a town, like it could be Calibo or Taal, of a certain age, well, you were actually required to go to the public school for instruction. Yeah. Oh, sir, sorry. Sir, we have another question. By the Did way, there are, there are specialized studies on this. I didn't just pick it, pick this up from the air. 
their specialized studies on the emergence of public education in the Philippines. They were written as far back as the 1950s, 1960s by Father Frederick Fox, published in Philippine Studies. These are available online. Okay, our next question is, do you think Intramuros still captured the Spanish colonial times in the Philippines? Do you think we have to make Intramuros uniform with the period it symbolized? Um, I'm very leery about saying Spanish because that, that will forever alienate Filipinos. Let's say it's a Filipino urbanism. As, Father, uh, as Pedro Luengo pointed out yesterday, we have to emphasize the native element to make it more more relevant. Besides, I don't know what period. I mean, Intramuros, it's, Manila itself underwent evolution. Manila in the late 19th century is no longer the Intramuros of the 18th century or 17th century. It was an evolution. So what are we talking about? So. We have a question from Estela Duque. Uh, here's what she said. Could you please explain a bit more why Intramuros itself as space, a physical site, the Philippines' largest urban heritage town and a 21st century touristic venue continues to provide a continuity of the historic discourse you spoke of, but now between modern Filipino, Spanish, and Chinese culture. A really interesting example is the uncontrolled intrusion of Chinese-funded projects at the borders of Intramuros. Wow, that's a big question, Estela. I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the, the gist of your question. But definitely, historically, it was, it was it provided a dialogue between the Iberian world, the Spanish world, the native world, and the Chinese. You can see that very clearly because the elite in the Philippines, as I pointed out, was largely Chinese mestizo. To give an example, the wealthiest man in the 18th century was Antonio Tuason. Tuason. Uh, and he was the only person in the islands who was granted a patent of nobility by the Spanish government. So there, um, his descendants are realized they're Chinese of Chinese origin, but at the same time proud of um, their, their Spanish legacy. So it, it, people like him provide a space for creating this dialogue. Now today, I don't I don't know what what uh, Australia's question is all about. About today. Well, we know that uh, Chinese business interests in the, in, in the Philippines have grown tremendously. So uh, um, how would that touch Intramuros? I guess um, potentially Chinese business interests, unless unchecked, can destroy the area. Thank you, sir. Uh, what is the relationship with the seven churches of Rome and the seven churches of Intramuros. Is there a connection between the seven of both cities? And if ever, what is the significance of the number seven? Ah, well, I don't, I think there are more churches in Rome than seven churches. <laughs> Plenty of churches in Rome, more than seven. I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50. All right, sir. Uh, we have, a question here. How should the Intramuros administration revitalize the Filipino roots of the city? Should the city not also revive also the ports of Raja Suleiman or showcase the pottery and other artifacts that have been unearthed? Oh, definitely. I think uh, the story of Raja Suleiman has to be highlighted, as well as the pottery. Um, Manila produced a distinct type of pottery. That should be highlighted also, definitely. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have another question. Does the Golden Tara have the face of a Filipino? What sets it different from other Asian statues? What makes it so unique? Wow, I don't know what you mean by Filipino. What Filipino? The Filipino Batuan? The Filipino Batayas? <laughs> Hard question to answer. No, but it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic statuette, right? It's spectacular. It's made of gold. Yes, sir. Uh, if Intramuros and much of Manila was not ruined by war, would Filipino aesthetics in terms of built heritage would have been different in approach, in planning and design? Well, it was really more than the war. It was a change in attitude. 
because there was a tendency in the 40s and 50s to just turn back, turn our backs on everything that went before us backward. So that was the problem. You know, actually, many parts of Manila escaped the war. Huh? Uh, when I grew up in Quiapo, large parts of Quiapo still uh, retained their 19th century look. And I enjoyed going to San Nicolas because San Nicolas, which, was, which began between 1863 and uh, the 1900s, still preserved many of his streetscapes. But this was the 50s and 60s, nobody, until now, in fact, we're already in the um, 21st century. Very few people thought it important to preserve these streetscapes. Thank you, sir. Our next question is from RJ Punumbaya. Intramuros is located at the heart of urban Manila. How should we promote the walled city in such ways that it should speak of Manila as a cosmopolitan capital? Well, it, probably any plans for Intramuros have to keep take into consideration the 21st century. Perhaps it can be a, a site for startups, telecom uh, related companies. Thank you, sir. What role should the Catholic Church play in the revitalization and promotion of the tangible and intangible heritage of Intramuros? I think due to Vatican II, we have also lost many beautiful traditions such as hymns and feasts, even fiesta delicacies? Oh, well, um, I think the Catholic Church has done its part. At, the, at least it has opened um, San Agustin as a museum. The cathedral has been preserved. I don't know what else it can, it can do. Yes, sir. How do you suggest to promote the history and heritage contained in Intramuros to non-Manilenios? Uh, examples like the, B, the Visayas or from Mindanao. Yeah, but that's it. That's why I was stressing how Intramuros contributed to the making of the Filipino nation. Because otherwise, if you're a Visayan, you'll be wondering, ano kinalaman ng Intramuros sa akin? The connection has to be made. Like um, I pointed out, actually, the missionaries um, started parishes, right? Uh, one of the ways they started uh, started par parishes was by bringing in the, the plow. The plows were actually uh, crafted in Intramuros. Huh? It was a royal foundry in Intramuros. I think it was located in Balwarte de San Diego, if I'm not mistaken. So th those were the plows that they brought to the province. And then the, the products that they brought, like uh, camote and corn, were first cultivated first nurtured the nursery grounds of their convents. So there's a connection, definitely. Plus, a lot of the parishes, in the Visayas, for instance, became the uh, core of towns and cities in the Visayas today. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, next question is, sir, in 1971, Robert Reed, wrote that Intramuros, I'm sorry, Manila under Soliman was a supra, ba, supra barangay, is a supra barangay. Yes. So um, it seems he implies that it, its uh, prestige it was greater than Tondo. What is your comment about this? Yeah, well, you were struggling with the question. I'm, I'm familiar with Robert Reed. I read all his three books, including his two unpublished books on Manila. Uh, he's struggling with the idea, was it a city or not? So he, he coins the term Supra Barangay. He says the prestige of Manila was greater than that of Tondo. Well, I'm not sure about that because um, Tondo also had an older prestige dating back centuries. Manila was relatively new by the 16th century. Still, still new. I think the memory of Binondo was, was still there. I think what Manila had, which Tondo did not have, was it had, it had a fortification. And it was allied to the royal houses of Sulu and Brunei. That Tondo did not have. Okay, sir. Um, if the domestic houses in Tramuros are still intact, do you think it will be the, it will be the same uh, it will be the ancestral, sorry, 
let me read the question properly. If the domestic houses in Tramuros are still intact, do you think it will be of the same prestige with the houses of Vigan? Well, uh, of course. I mean, the houses in, in Tramuros are quite different from those in Vigan. The houses in Vigan um, are all brick, first floor, second floor. The houses in Tramuros are quite different. The, the houses I showed you of Kema and Burgos are actually closer in spirit to those of Tramuros. Definitely, the houses in Ramuras were, were prestigious, palatial, many, uh, quite a number of them. If we have lost them, that's why we think only in terms of vegan. We have a viewer who is asking, what's Dr. Jalzita's opinion on the Intramuros golf course? Should it stay or should it go? If it goes, what can we replace the area with? Okay, let me just point out that for years, I thought the golf course was a good compromise because that kept the moats from being misused. I remember I used to get so embarrassed when I would bring tourists before because right below Fort Santiago was a slum area. So I was happy when they decided to extend the golf course to encompass it. But I think there's now talk about possibly creating a public park instead of a to replace the golf course, which I think is gr great because we need more public spaces for our people to enjoy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, our next question is, what is the significance of the Lanaval in Intramuros? <laughs> I think the significance of Lanaval in Intramuros has been lost already. Okay, well, if you read Nick Wakin and consult also our elders, uh, the procession of La Naval was an important event because it commemorated the victory of Filipino and Spanish forces over the Dutch who came in 1646 and vastly outnumbered the local forces in terms of number of ships, in terms of weaponry. But um, they, were, they were pushed back. Uh, how? Well, according to, according to tradition, the, the Spaniards and Filipinos kept praying to Our Lady of the Rosary as they were fighting against the Dutch. So that kept their morale high. And so they were able to suffer few casualties and it's, while, while inflicting heavy casualties on the Dutch. Now, the memory of that fiesta has disappeared with the destruction of Santo Domingo. Because Santo Domingo was where the statue of Our Lady of the Rosary called the Naval de Manila was was enthroned. So, in fact, the celebration now of La Naval de Manila is focused on Quezon City, no longer Manila. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Uh, what caused the exodus of the institutions and the rich from Intramuros? I thought it was the war, but it happened earlier pala. According to your talk, like in the 1840s, like USD's departure and the Governor General's departure, was Intramuros already a backwater by then, compared okay. with Pinondo, Ermita, San Miguel? Okay, 1830, of course, Intram no, UST was in Intramuros all the way down to World War II. The schools were Intramuros. The convents and the churches were in Intramuros. Now, I'm talking about the elite, the wealthy. They began moving out of Intramuros because, well, why live Intramuros if you can afford a villa across the river, where you can have fresh air, gardens, view of the Pasig, and you can bathe regularly in the Pasig. So that's that's what drew them out of uh, the walled city. So in a sense, Intramuros steadily, be steadily became a backwater in terms of income level. However, it was still the seat of government and still, still the seat of the church. So it had an importance all the way down to the 1930s. However, by the 1930s, American period, uh, new government buildings had already been constructed outside. But the churches were still there. So that still drew people regularly to Intramuros. And that is what my relatives like to talk about, the churches, and how they would go to Intramuros regularly to visit the churches for the fiestas. Uh, so you're saying, sir, that the Intramuros was blighted. That's why the rich left. 
Yeah. All right. Yes, sir. Um, we have another question. Do you think the Intramuros building code has been followed? Should it be imposed for uniformity? Wow. <laughs> well, this is a very important question. I've always thought that, first of all, you have to have a style book. It has to be clear to the public why, uh, what, what are the principles of this style that they should follow, and what is the rationale? Because if, uh, unless there's a style book, people will build in any way they want, and they will think it's in a position if you don't explain to them what is the logic behind each element of the style. I think people are rational. If you explain to them, I think they will understand. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, you mentioned earlier that Tondo area is where the rich traders reside before the Spanish came to Manila. Is there any Portuguese settlement around Tondo or in Ita area? Thank you. Oh, no, no, no. There's no Portuguese settlement. Definitely not. Yeah. There's, there's no evidence of that. Thank you, sir. Not Ermita. Ermita was uh, open field, yeah. Uh, this is a follow-up question to an earlier question wherein you seemed hesitant to to how Intamuros should be conserved, if it should maintain its Hispanic imagery or not. With that being said, do you still believe that the Filipino identity is Hispanic? Because if not, then I agree that modern urban concepts should be embraced. But if your answer is yes, shouldn't we emphasize more on its Hispanic imagery, such as architecture, landscape, etc.? regardless of epoch? I think the, que the question is an either or, uh, either Hispanic or Filipino. But I'm arguing that Filipino identity, the, I, I'm talking about the mainstream, the mainstream Filipino identity has elements that are both indigenous, Chinese, and Spanish. Um, I, sh I showed you the kind of architecture that developed in, archi in, in the Muros, the domestic architecture. You cannot call that Hispan Spanish. Uh, it's not found in Spain. That develop in Manila. It has Spanish elements, but it also strong Chinese and native elements. It's Filipino. As that is in fact the argument of Dr. Pedro Vengo yesterday. You have to be careful about the term Spanish. Uh, thank you, sir. That was actually our last question. Okay, good. Uh, all right. So that's it for today. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your time. And to all our viewers who wish to ask questions, if ever, uh, you can email our professor at fjalcita at ateneo.edu. Uh, that's right. fjalcita at ateneo.edu if you have more questions in mind. Again, thank you, everyone, sir, uh, Professor Jalcita. Okay. Thank you so much for your. Thank you so much for your time and for everyone who watched us today, thank you. And we have uh, some announcements. Next week, we will have two more episodes of the Intramuros Learning Sessions. Next week, we will feature Xiao Chua, who will be talking about Port Santiago in the context of Philippine history, and Dr. Victor Torres, who will be talking about the Monuments of Intramuros. If you wish to register, please visit our Facebook channel at, uh, at Intramuros Administration. Thank you, everyone, and good day. Okay. Thank you, too.